Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Augusta. We're glad you could join us this morning. My name's Barbara Bowen, and I'm your worship associate today. Our service will begin after a few announcements from our board president, Alan George. Good morning. I'm Alan George, president of the Board of Trustees. And today, as we're doing every Sunday, we're going to start uh, start out with announcing the Coffee with the Minister for Visitors. Um, that'll be on Zoom following the service at 12 noon, and I'll be pasting the link to that Coffee with the Minister in the chat uh, when I'm done with the announcements. Uh, bring your taste buds to the chili cook-off from 12.30 to 2.30 in the UUCA playground area. Donations will be accepted at the event. Bring your own bowl and spoon or commemorative mugs will also be available at the site for $10. The Humanist Free Thought Group will meet this evening at 5 p.m. online. Please contact Frank Carl for information. Calling all middle school and high school age youth later this evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Join a virtual youth group meeting for some holiday activities and a brainstorming session about how you envision your youth group. Contact Kim Miner for more information about this event. The UU Monday Meditation Group Gathering will meet online tomorrow, Monday, December 14th from 7 to 8.30. Contact Elizabeth McNabb or Melanie Roberts for information. Our virtual Blue Christmas service will be held on Tuesday, December 15th at 7 p.m. This is a special service of music and meditation to acknowledge the difficulties of the season and the complex emotions that many of us feel during this time. The Board of Trustees will hold our monthly meeting this Thursday, 17th of December, online at 6.30 p.m. Contact me for information if you wish to attend. Board meetings are open for any church member. Please check this week's e-announcements for the contact information for these groups and others you may wish to register for. There is also a link to the UUCA calendar that will let you know what is going on at the church during the week and the rest of the month. The church remains tenuously in phase three of its reopening guidelines which are posted on our Facebook page, allowing groups of less than 15 to meet at the church. Please let your board liaison and the church administrator know if you wish to meet at the church. So a reopening team member or board liaison can answer questions, guide you through the process and forward the opening and closing guidelines. Cases are rising throughout the country. And if the moving weekly average of cases rises above our threshold in the Columbia, Richmond and Aiken County area, the church will go back to phase two and face-to-face -face meetings within the building will have to stop. The reopening team is closely monitoring the COVID-19 tri-county trending and will make you aware of our weekly reopening phase in e announcements and leaders of any planned church meetings will be immediately notified. And finally, please get immunized against the seasonal flu. It is your best defense on preventing getting the flu for those ages six months and older. Continue to perform hand hygiene by washing your hand or using alcohol hand sanitizer, wearing a face cover when outside, keep that six feet of social distancing and stay at home when sick. These measures prevent the flu and a coronavirus infection. And back to you, Barbara. Now, please join David in our opening hymn. Good morning, all. Uh, we are going to be opening with hymn 226, People Look East. It's one of my most favorite hymns, uh, Advent hymns. 
the melody is hundreds of years old, but the words are written recently or more recently by Eleanor Fargion, who also wrote the words to uh, the Cat Stevens song, Morning Has Broken. So that's something that a lot of people don't know. 226, people look east. <laughs> David. I really like that one. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, and we have been honoring the many traditions that find meaning in this season of returning light. This morning, as we light our third candle, our reading will be given by Tim Hunter and his family. Good morning. Welcome to our Interfaith Advent Wreath Lighting. The Advent wreath is a traditionally Christian practice, but the symbolism of fire has meaning in many different contexts. As Unitarian Universalists, we celebrate as one of our six sources of wisdom, the words and deeds of prophetic people, which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. We count among our UU forebearers, abolitionists, prison reformers, suffragists, civil rights workers, pacifists, anti-poverty activists, LGBTQ liberationists, and many more. We know there is much of their work that remains to be done. And so I, well, Robert, lights the first, second, and third candles in the spirit of their passion for a better world. May it burn within us still. The meditation of Curtis <laughs> Now the joys and sorrows of this week from our congregation will be received by Marita from the pastoral care team. Now for meditation. Throughout history and across all the continents of this earth, humans have sought to understand this universe and their place in it. Through the light of reason and the light of faith, they have sought answers. And as the answers, as our knowledge has grown and so have our answers grown and changed. But there's one question that we never can seem to satisfy. And that is why. Why we constantly ask like children, if things are like this, why are they like this and not something else? Why in fact, is there anything rather than nothing at all? 
Why is the question that has as many answers as there are people who ask it of themselves? So for our meditation today, I would like you to consider that question of why and what your answer is as we share a time of silence and contemplation. This church is special. It's the only one I've ever attended that welcomed questions and accepted all of our individual answers. The first service I came to here, it was announced that there would be a talk back where we could discuss the sermon and what we thought about it. I was hooked right there. I became a supporter from that church from time on, from that time on. Now, I would like to ask you to join with me in supporting this church as it supports us in our search for truth and meaning for ourselves and for others like us. You can donate online at the address appearing on our screen. Our reading is from Elaine Pagels. And if you're interested in the Gnostic tradition, 
Elaine Pagels is a scholar to go to. And I remember how excited I was at a general assembly that she was speaking there. And I just like to share the experience because there was a podium in the middle of a huge stage and she would walk back and forth on the stage. And when she got a little lost, she would come back to the podium and find her place and then off again. And it, it was just wonderful. Anyway, this from Elaine Pagels, it's in her book, The Gnostic Gospels. Jesus Christ rose from the grave. With this proclamation, the Christian church began. This may be the fundamental element of the Christian faith. Certainly, it is its most radical. Other religions celebrate cycles of birth and death. Christianity insists that in one unique historical moment, the cycle reversed and a dead man came back to life. For Jesus' followers, this was the turning point in world history, the sign of its coming in. Orthodox Christians since then have confessed in the creed that Jesus of Nazareth, crucified, dead, and buried, was raised on the third day. Many today recite that creed without thinking about what they're saying, much less actually believing it. I grew up Episcopal, and I can relate to that. Recently, some ministers, theologians, and scholars have challenged the literal view of resurrection. To account for this doctrine, they point out its psychological appeal to our deepest fears and hopes. To explain it, they offer symbolic interpretations. But much of the early tradition insists literally that a man, Jesus, had come back to life. What makes these Christian accounts so extraordinary is not the claim that his friends had seen Jesus after his death. Ghost stories, hallucinations, and visions were even more commonplace then than now, but that they saw an actual human being. At first, according to Luke, the disciples themselves and their astonishment and terror at the appearance of Jesus among them immediately assumed that they were seeing a ghost. But Jesus challenged them, handle me and see me, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. Since they remained incredulous, he asked for something to eat as they watched in amazement. He ate a piece of broiled fish. The point is clear. No ghost can do that. Had they said that Jesus' spirit lived on, surviving bodily decay, their contemporaries might have thought that their stories made sense. Yet some Christians dissent. Without denying the resurrection, they reject the literal interpretation and find it and I quote, extremely revolting, repugnant, and impossible. Gnostic Christians interpret re resurrection in various ways. Some say that the person who experiences the resurrection does not meet Jesus raised physically back to life. Rather, he or she encounters Christ on a spiritual level. This may occur in dreams, in aesthetic trance, in visions, or in moments of spiritual illumination. But the Orthodox condemn all such interpretations. Tertullian, a church father, declares that anyone who denies the resurrection of the flesh is a heretic, not a Christian. This ends our reading. Okay, we're not having a musical interlude, right? We begin with meditations from the Gospel of Thomas. These passages from this Gnostic text read like Zen poets, those nonsensical questions that are designed to puzzle and frustrate the seeker into enlightenment. I will offer a few of them shortly. I hope that these passages attributed to Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas will serve is a quiet contemplative experience as an open doorway to understanding this group of early Christians. They were as different theologically from their contemporaries 
as we are from ours. I'll allow a brief period of silence between each passage. Let those who seek continue seeking until they find. When they find, they will become troubled. When they become troubled, they will be astonished and they will rule over all. If those who lead say to you, see the kingdom of God is in the sky, then the birds in the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known and you will realize that it is you who are the children of the living God. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. The person old in days will not hesitate to ask a small child seven days old about the place of life, and that person will live. For many who are first will become last, and they will become the same. His disciples asked, do you want us to fast? How shall we pray? Shall we give alms? What diet shall we observe? Jesus said, do not tell lies and do not do what you hate, for all things are plain in the sight of heaven. For nothing hidden will not become manifest, and nothing covered will remain without being uncovered. His disciples asked, tell us how the end will be. And Jesus said, have you discovered then the beginning that you look for the end? For where the beginning is, there will be the end. Blessed are those who will take their place in the beginning. They will know the end and will not experience death. Love your sister and brother like your soul. Guard them like the pupil of your eye. The prophets are accepted in their own village. Oh, I'm sorry. No prophets are accepted in their own village. No physicians heal those who know them. If two make peace with each other in this one house, they will say to the mountain, move away, and it will move away. His disciples asked, when will the repose of the dead come about? And when will the new world come? He said to them, what you look forward to has already come, but you do not recognize it. Blessed is the one who has suffered and found life. The kingdom of God is like a certain woman she took a little leaven and sealed it in some dough and made it into large loaves. Let those who have ears hear. His disciples asked, when will the kingdom come? Jesus said, it will not come by waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying, here it is or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of God is spread out upon the earth, and people do not see it. What we just heard is not the Jesus that many of us have come to know in our Christian upbringing. The Gnostic Gospels are very different from the ones found in the New Testament. They are a collection of diverse texts. They were discovered 75 years ago near the Egyptian town of Nagamedi, actually found by a teenager playing in caves. 
Hence the name of the published collection, the Nakamidi Library. Some of them were written at about the time of the New Testament Gospels. Some were written later. They mostly deal with the life and teachings of Jesus. Who were these early Christians we call Gnostics? Who were these early dissenters that Elaine Pagel spoke of in our reading this morning? The word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which translates its knowledge. Specifically, it means knowledge gained by observation or experience. More specifically, it means by observation and knowledge of our own soul through individual self-searching. The Gnostics believe that to know oneself in the deepest sense is to know God. If that sounds familiar, it's because it has a parallel in Unitarian Universalism. Consider Ralph Waldo Emerson's description of what he calls the Oversoul. Within us is the soul of the whole, a wise silence, the universal beauty, to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. When it breaks through our intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through our will, it is virtue. When it flows through our affections, it is love. The Gnostic way of self-knowledge is nicely summed up by a Gnostic teacher of those early times. Abandon the search for God and creation and matters of similar sort. Look for God by taking yourself to the starting point. Learn who it is within you who makes everything your own and says, my God, my mind, my thought, my soul, my body. Learn the sources of sorrow, joy, love, hate. If you carefully investigate these matters, you will find God in yourself. Buddha says the same thing, but is more plain spoken. Be ye lamps unto yourselves, be your own confidence. Hold to the truth within yourselves is to the only lamp. And yes, the Gnostic Christians held to a very different lamp than did their Orthodox contemporaries. Their Gospels differ in three basic ways from the New Testament Gospels. One, the New Testament presents God as a totally other being. The Gnostic Gospels present God as imminent in the world. In the Gnostic sense, the human soul and God are one. Two, in the New Testament, Jesus speaks of sin and repentance and is represented as a savior. The Gnostic Gospels speak of Jesus in terms of illusion and enlightenment. This is a distinctly Eastern flavored view. For the Gnostics, Jesus is a spiritual God. Three, in the New Testament, Jesus is presented as unique. In the Gnostic Gospels, Jesus is presented as coming from the same source of being as each one of us. We all possess within ourselves the only Lamb. These fundamental differences between them did not set well with the Orthodox Christians. The Gnostics knew they were heretics. They hid their scriptures deep in a cave. Had they been discovered a thousand or more years ago, the Gnostic texts would have been burned for heresy. But they remained hidden until 1945. A modern experience has given us a new perspective on the issues they raise. Today, we read them with different eyes, not merely as madness and blasphemy. We read them as Christians in the first century. I'm sorry. We read them as Christians in the first century experience them as a powerful alternative to what we know as orthodox in the Christian tradition. One area the Gnostics called into question is patriarchal culture. 
In the story of Adam and Eve, for example, the Orthodox view sees knowledge as sin. Eve is the channel of that knowledge and by implication is the channel for sin. The Gnostic version presents Eve as the channel for knowledge, knowledge as enlightenment. For the Gnostics, one might say that Eve was the bringer of light into the world, not the bringer of sin. The same spirit in Gnosticism, which took a positive view of Eve, also attributed both feminine and masculine attributes to God. The Gnostic view of divinity is one of a harmonic, dynamic relationship of opposites. It very much resembles Eastern religion in this way. The Taoist yin yang is a good example. The Orthodox, on the other hand, carefully sorted out all sources containing feminine in imagery of God in arriving at the collection of writings that would become the New Testament. Imagine how different our culture would be if the Gnostics had won the struggle for orthodoxy. There would have been no need for an equal rights amendment. Even our concept of authority would be much different. Interestingly enough, the Gnostic concept of authority is closely linked with their view of the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, the primary factor separating the Gnostics from their Christian contemporaries lies in their view of the resurrection. The Orthodox Christian view insists upon the actual physical resurrection of Jesus. The Gnostics understood it as a spiritual resurrection, as a symbol of aspiration. For the Gnostics, spiritual authority rests with the individual seeker. The Christian church today still bases its authority on apostolic secession. It begins with the apostle Peter and is passed down through ordination by the symbolic laying on of hands. Can you see the political implications of this? It places authority and control in the hands of a few. It keeps the selection process for new leadership in the hands of those same few. And those same few can only be male. However, if the resurrection is seen as spiritual, if revelation is achieved through self-exploration of one's personal death, then a more democratic process must exist through which leadership is selected and maintained. Therefore, personal responsibility, not outer authority, becomes the mode of operation. Elaine Pagels gets right to the point when she writes, Gnostic Christians assert that what distinguishes the false from the true church is not its relationship to the clergy, but the level of understanding of its members and the quality of their relationship with one another. Well, sounds to me like a Unitarian Universalist church or congregation. Are you beginning to feel some kinship with these Gnostics? I leave you with Jesus of the Gospel of Thomas. The kingdom of God is inside you, and it is outside you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the children of the living God. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. Buddha says the same thing, but it's more plain spoken. Be ye lamps unto yourselves, be your own confidence. Hold to the truth within yourselves as to the only lamp. Amen and blessed be. And David, our next hymn, and it is Passover, and I'm so delighted that we're doing Light One Candle, written by Peter, Paul, and Mary.
Yorn-D, going to do a candle. I just went out, we're celebrating Hanukkah this week, not Passover. That comes oh, out spring. Oh, my so gosh. Hanukkah. Did not I do that? Okay. Anyway, we are seeing a 221 light one candle to celebrate the Hanukkah season. Uh, I believe tonight is the fourth night. Maybe. Um, we will sing the first two verses only. And here we go. Children, thanks that their light didn't die. Light one candle for pain they endured, their right to exist was denied. Light one candle for the terrible sacrifice of justice and freedom demand. But light one candle for wisdom to know when peace and the maker at hand. Don't let the light go out. It's lasted for so many years. Don't let the light go out to shine through our love and our tears. Light one candle for the strength that we need to never become our own foe. Light one candle for those who have suffering the pain we learned so long ago. Light one candle for all we believe in, that anger won't get us apart. Light one candle to bring us together when peace is the song in our heart. Don't let the light go out. It's lasted for so many years. Don't let the light go out to shine through our love and our tears. Our closing words are from Rebecca Parker. She was once president of Star King School for the Ministry. Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. Our, um, we're going to continue the Hanukkah theme for our postlude, and we're going to play a, a jazz version of the hymn Yim, Mi Yimalel, which is um, actually in our hymnal, but uh, in a different arrangement here. Mi Yimalel for Hanukkah. <laughs> 